Now, news is moving fast on the coronavirus front. You've heard some of it uh, earlier today, but even tonight, things are changing. And the government's response to it, we're going to give you the latest. First, now we have this $2.1, $2.2 trillion relief package that both parties, it seems like, finally agreed on today. This $2.2 trillion legislative package is bigger than anything I believe ever passed in Congress. Uh, perhaps, uh, relatively speaking, uh, if you go back, look during the FDR New Deal days, there was something that, if you time value it, you could say it was bigger. I don't know. But this is certainly, in terms of dollars, by far and away the biggest ever, ever done. And well, of course, that has sent a lot of conservatives just, like, gasping uh, when they heard that. But we knew it was coming. And most of us did understand that something needed to be done to help American workers and businesses. There's a lot, though, at the same time not to like in this package. Now, check this out. Nancy Pelosi is still holding out for this provision that would basically gut any state voter ID requirements. I kid you not. And it's all sorts of stuff with the ballot harvesting. This is a nightmare. So I, I thinking about this, I guess they're watching old Joe's campaign stumbles. So the, the, the whole thing is really starting to look like a weekend at Biden's, as I said a few weeks ago. And another concern that the federal unemployment benefits, we want people to get help, but will last 39 weeks. In other words, through the end of 2020, God help us if this shutdown goes on that long or any, anywhere approaching that long. So when you add up the state unemployment benefits with the federal benefits, the average weekly unemployment check will be about $972, which, again, when you do the math, exceeds the median weekly earnings of American workers from quarter four of last year. Meanwhile, the dire tone seemed to change today at the New York governor's COVID-19 briefing. Cuomo seemed to let up a little bit on the blame game. It's something that our team is working on uh, with the White House team. And I want to thank the president for his uh, cooperation and his team for their cooperation. Well, that was good to hear. And even as New York still accounts for about 60 percent of new COVID cases in the U.S., there is more room for optimism. It actually appears that the rate of hospitalizations is slowing. Remember, the big concern always has been a potential collapse of the health care system. This past Sunday, the projection was that hospitalizations were doubling every two days, okay? On Monday, the numbers suggested that the hospitalizations were doubling every 3.4 days. On Tuesday, the projections suggested that the hospitalizations were doubling every 4.7 days. Now, that is almost too good to be true. The arrows are headed in the right direction, and that is always better than the arrows uh, headed in the wrong direction. Well, I'll say. And the number of new infections in New York is starting to show some signs of uh, good news as well. On Monday, the state reported an increase of 5,707. On Tuesday, it went up 4,790. That's nearly a thousand person decrease in the rate of increase. That kind of gets confusing. But in today, it went up 5,146. But that's still down from two days ago. You see those trends. Now, if that trend does hold, it's really good news about when this nightmare actually peaks and then we start seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Let's hope. But fear is powerful. We all know that. And in this case, it's, it's understandable, given what we've seen around the world, especially in places like Italy. But fear alone should not drive policy. Facts and reliable, updated data should inform all of our projections. Dr. Burks from the Coronavirus Task Force seemed to be alluding to that today. We're really dealing with the here and now while we're planning for the future. And I think the numbers that have been put out there are actually very frightening to people. But I can tell you, if you go back and look at Wuhan and Hubei and all of these provinces, when they talk about 60,000 people being infected, even if you said, oh, right, well, there's asymptomatics and all of that, so you get to 600,000 people out of 80 million. That is nowhere close to the numbers that you see people putting out there. I think it has frightened the American people. 
that's perspective. We need that perspective, as scary as this seems. And finally, new drug therapies are being tested and used, including one used even to treat gout. An antibodies test may tell us who already has immunity to this virus, may have gotten it, not had a big, uh, strong reaction to it, already developing those uh, important immunities. That'll also help us prepare better for the future. And around the world, countries are taking different approaches. India has a total lockdown now. And after Italy's horrific experience, you kind of can't blame people. Extreme social distancing. It's affected in the UK and Spain. But Sweden and Denmark have rejected the total lockdown approach. Uh, and they're getting some grief for it, but are not seeing a greater rate of infection than some of their European counterparts. That's really interesting. Only time will tell which approach was right and which one might have been going a little too, too extreme. But for us, we're ending day 10 of the first 15 days. Uh, and how much longer can we anticipate this shutdown lasting?